Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module. Um, this is part of the WITS RHI catch-up sessions. This particular module is module 3B on pediatric TB, where we are going to look at diagnosing TB in children. Diagnosing TB in children is always a challenge, but even more so if the child is also HIV infected. Our children with HIV can have a whole range of opportunistic infections that can have very similar symptoms. So, for example, just to differentiate between a community-acquired pneumonia and TB can be very challenging. They're also more likely to have negative tests, negative false DSTs, um, AFBs less likely. Even the gene experts are not as um, easy to pick up bacilli as they are in the adults. And often they have general symptomatic signs um, of their illness that's also suggestive of TB. So they might be chronically ill, they might have lymphadenopathy, they might have failure to thrive, they might be anemic. And if they do get TB disease, it tends to be more severe TB disease with a much higher morbidity and higher mortality. And um, they tend to also have more drug side effects, both on the TB drugs and the ARVs. There are a few key points to keep in mind with the diagnosis of TB in childhood. Firstly, there has been various algorithms proposed over the years, but none of these have proven to be very reliable. Um, for example, having points for various symptoms to try and help a clinician make a diagnosis. And because children TB is a porcy bacillary disease, they do not produce a lot um, of bacilli. It's very difficult to obtain bacteriological confirmation. Um, and therefore, mostly the diagnosis is determined through clinical judgment. Um, and you often need to treat without even having microbiologic biological confirmation. You therefore are going to rely on a cluster of symptoms and signs and history to help you make a decision. Um, it's very prudent with children TB to not rush. Quite often it's uh, sensible to try and treat with a course of antibiotics, to watch what the weight and the symptoms does over a few weeks before putting a child on TB treatment. Uh, conversely, you don't want to end up being in a situation where you have a child with TB who's being treated every two or three months um, with antibiotics and the diagnosis is never made. And very important, um, always, always look for HIV in any child that's been diagnosed with TB. So I'm going to go um, through a very specific approach on diagnosing TB in childhood because what you're trying to do is you're trying to put together a picture of an index of suspicion on how likely is it that this child is presenting with TB. And there's five important questions you're going to ask yourself. Question number one is, what is the risk to this child? How likely is it that this child has developed TB disease? Um, the second question is, has this child had a TB contact or is there a known exposure to TB? Your third question has to... Um, focus on the symptoms of this child, are there TB symptoms? When you then examine your child and do your basic x-ray examination, can I find any signs of TB? And lastly, importantly, if possible, try and find some bacteriological confirmation um, and do some investigations. So we're going to go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So the first question we're going to look at is risk. And the question is, what is the risk to this particular child of sitting in front of me that this child, if they have TB infection, that it might have progressed to TB disease? And this has got to do with the age of the child. So children under the age of two years has got a very um, immature immune system. And if they are infected with TB infection, there's a very high risk that it will progress to TB disease. Similarly, any child who also have HIV, no matter what the age, is at a higher risk of their TB infection progressing to TB disease. That risk stays there until the child is about five years old, but it's not quite um, as high the risk as, there is, as the little is. What's interesting is once children are adolescents, the risk starts to go up again, and our adolescents seems to be a bit more vulnerable to TB disease. But what's interesting is that our primary school children, our HIV negative primary school children, um, have a much lower risk of TB infection progressing to TB disease. And you will therefore have a different index of suspicion in a child who is eight years old with a cough versus a child who is two years old with a cough who've both been exposed to TB. So to be able to make a decision on the risk of your child, you actually have to do an HIV test. Um, and therefore you cannot um, make an assessment of TB infection, of TB disease, unless you know what the HIV status of the child is. 
So now you've looked at your age and you've decided, okay, this child is a high risk maybe because of their age or their HIV status, and then it's very important to find out about exposure. You cannot develop TB disease unless you've got TB infection. Now, in adults, we don't focus that much on exposure because they might have had been exposure um, years before, and adults are much more mobile in terms of work and transport, um, and it's therefore very difficult to sometimes trace where did they get the infection from. But this is different from children, and the younger the child is, the easier it should be able to find out if they've been exposed to somebody with TB. Now, children who are risky, as we've outlined in question number one, so these are our very young children or our children with HIV, if they do get TB infection, they're going to progress to TB disease within quite a short period of time, within six months to a year. So you should be able to get a history of exposure to a contact um, within that time period. And your history of exposure is essential as part of your pediatric TB assessment. Sometimes it's a challenge because the child is brought in, um, not necessarily by the main carer, but by a cousin or a sister or an auntie. Um, and that is where we want to be able to use something like our MAN2 test to give us a bit more of an idea of whether the child has been TB exposed. So let's just talk a little bit about the MAN2. So let's just say a few things about TST and TB exposure. If you have a good history of TB exposure, it might not be necessary to do the TST at all, because all the TST um, tells you is that this child has TB infection and has been exposed to somebody who has TB. But remember, it doesn't tell you about TB disease. If you do have a child who is HIV infected or is under five years old and you have a positive TB test, um, you need to obviously look for TB. But if the TB screen is negative and you're confident the child does not have TB, um, we would actually want to give that child IPT prophylaxis for six months. A negative TST does not rule out TB infection or TB disease, especially in our HIV positive children who might have a very low CD4 count um, and is simply not giving an immunological response to that test. Lastly, very importantly, is that as I highlighted earlier, your children under five years old and especially under two is at a very high risk that if they get TB infection, that TB infection might progress to TB disease. And so there is a general rule that every single child under the age of five, if they've been exposed to TB, they get a course of INH for six months every single time. A positive TST in the past tends to stay positive. Um, and that can be unreliable. So it's also important if you are going to do a TST just to make sure that it's not been done in the past. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on how you do a TST test or the MAN2 test. Usually they are um, given by the nurses as an intradermal injection on the left forearm. And it needs to be read 48 to 72 hours later. And it's very important to counsel the patients properly because quite often they end up missing that second appointment. For you as a, as a doctor, the most important part is being able to read a TST if you see that child 24 to 72 hours later. And the rule is very simple. We are measuring the bump, not the redness. So we want to measure the induration. Um, and a simple trick is to use a pen and mark the, each edge of the, the induration, so the bit that you can actually feel under your fingers. And you can use a ruler to then measure um, that distance. To interpret it, it will depend on the HIV status of the child. If the child is HIV positive and there's a TST of larger than 5 millimeters, we would, we would say that's TB infection. Um, if it is more than 10 millimeters um, and the child is HIV negative, we also consider that a proof of TB exposure. Um, and you can see we don't really take the BCG history um, into account. And just like there can be false negative MAN2 tests, you can also have false positive MAN2 tests. So our previous BCG vaccination, and there's confusion about how much it contributes to that MAN2 test. Um, but a big factor might be serial TSTs. So if you've got a child who's regularly presenting with a cough, and every now and then when the nurse sees the cough, she does another TST, that in itself can amplify the TST results in the future. Do you remember that if a child has had TB in the past, their TST will probably be positive? And there are environmental mycobacteria that can also cause a false positive um, MAN2 test. So we've got our first two um, questions now. We know how risky it is for this child to have gone from TB infection to TB disease. 
Um, and we also have been able to figure out or establish whether we think there's been TB exposure. Now we're going to look at the symptoms of TB and we are meant to be screening all our children and in adults we have those four main questions and I just want to um, just point out that the four questions for the children has got a slight difference. So we also use a cough for more than two weeks, not responding to antibiotics. In HIV children, we would normally say any cough qualifies as a possible symptom of TB. Persistent fever, so a child who has a fever for more than two weeks, it's very uncommon for children to be feverish for such a long period of time and um, without other very clear diagnosis. Weight loss, very important, more than 5% in the past three months. Um, but in children, also remember to add failure to thrive. So it's not only weight loss, you need to plot those weights and you need to be able to see if the child is crossing any centiles. And then, as you notice, the fourth symptom there is not actually night sweats, as lots of children do get night sweats, and it's not the easiest um, symptom to differentiate, therefore. But very typical with children is these children have tiredness, malaise, and they don't play. And it's very abnormal for a, children, for a child to not be playing for longer than two weeks. Night sweats can be an indication, as can loss of appetite, shortness of breath, chest pain, those are more non-specific symptoms that you're also going to look for and would, might make you suspicious. Once you've got your history of symptoms, we're now actually going to examine the child and what we're going to particularly look for is lymph nodes. So on examination, you might pick up some painless lymphadenopathy. Um, you might pick up some um, tenderness when you're examining the abdominal area. Obviously, there can be more severe signs such as angulation of the spine or actual scrofuloderma, uh, which is TB of the skin. Just watch out for the chronic superitative otitis media that's not responding to treatment. Feel free to take a swab, send it away for um, AFBs. And then a child who has um, neurological symptoms such as fits, vomiting, irritability, if that is being coupled with other TB symptoms, we'll be very concerned about TB meningitis. We're going to include here at signs of TB is your classic or most common presentation in your young child of TB is with hyalur or metastinal TB and that your um, lymphadenopathy, and you're only going to be able to diagnose that if you do an X-ray. So chest X-rays are not always available in our clinic settings. They're expensive, um, and there's not actually X-ray changes that are very specific for TB. They're all very nonspecific and can also be caused by a variety of other things. In children, we quite often look for the presence of hyalur lymph nodes um, and where it might be compressing major airways. But very important, you are not going to use an x-ray as a standalone TB test. In adults, this is an absolute no-no. In children, we use x-rays more often in adults because it's so difficult to make diagnosis. But do keep in mind, the um, main thing we are looking for is hyalur lymphadenopathy, and the lateral here is very important. We're going to look for a widened metastinum. Compression of the airways can be very suggestive of these lymph nodes. Pacification. Um, and in miller TB, and these children will be very sick with generalized TB, you might see these fine millet-sized lesions throughout the lung fields. Pleural effusions we don't really see in very young children, but any child with a pleural effusion over the age of 6 would be very suggestive of TB. And over the age of 12, our adolescents can present with pro proper cavitation lesions just like our adults do. But most importantly, you might have a completely normal X-ray in a child with TB, especially if they have HIV with a low CD4 count and the TB might be abdominal TB or TB of the brain. Here's just a, a couple of lovely X-rays to show um, hyalur lymphadenopathy. And it's very satisfying if you can see very clear hyalur lymphadenopathy as we do on this X-ray here. Um, and here's another um, beautiful example of hyalur lymphadenopathy. Um, but sometimes it's not so clear on the AP. And if you're looking for hyalur lymphadenopathy, if you're doing x-rays for a child for TB, it's essential to do a lateral. And on the lateral, we're looking for something that we call the donut sign. And you can see there's, um, you've got, I've got the conglomeration of lymph glands there, and you can see the diameter of a bronchus going through it, which gives the impression of a, of a donut. This is a good x-ray of miliary TB, very fine, small nodules scattered throughout the lungs, this child would be very sick and um, probably have disseminated disease um, and quite often includes um, the brain as well. 
So now we've gone through our risk, our exposure, we've looked at symptoms, we've looked at signs, um, and then we get to the bacteriological confirmation of our TB. And quite often, because it's so difficult to get bacteriological confirmation, people don't even bother to try. Um, but it's still very important to see if we can get a sample, some sort of sample, even if we can just send it for culture, um, especially because of the rising um, incidence of MDR-TB. So as we've mentioned earlier, children just don't make very uh, many bacilli because of the type of disease they get. So for example, if the child's got hyalur lymphadenopathy, they're not going to be producing positive AFBs um, or gene expert. And it's very difficult to get a good sample, especially in your children under eight years of age. Gastric aspirates is becoming more and more popular and becoming more and more advocated, but very difficult to get our clinics to do those, um, although it's not a particularly difficult procedure something where people have to be given training and have to have time to practice on how to get those samples. And sputum induction is generally very much recommended, but is not always available. You need to have all the right equipment to be able to do that. But we want to try and get a sample. And if you have a very ill child and you're suspecting disseminated TB, it's very worthwhile to try and send an early morning urine sample. It can have yields as much as 40% in our adults in disseminated TB, so worthwhile trying. I mean, disseminated TB is certainly worthwhile trying to do an LP um, in those children. Um, and you can also try and send blood samples um, in, the, in the back tech bottles. If there is a node, always important to FNA um, and to send both for, um, for slides. And if you get enough fluid, you can even send for a gene expert. They also now have a medium that you can order from the NHL. It's very small little bottles in which you can um, rinse your needle and send for for TB, for gene expert, and for culture. So maybe just a quick slide on TB sputum induction. Um, if gastric aspirates is not possible, this should be accessible at every primary healthcare clinic. And here's some of the basic equipment that you will need. Very important that these children can develop um, quite bad wheezing uh, when we um, nebulize them with hypertonic saline. It's therefore important to have a nebulizer, and you can see a little homemade um, uh, spacer here. So what you need to do is you're going to pre-treat your child with a bronchodilator using a little asthma pump and a spacer that you can make out of any water bottle. Um, and then after that, you're going to nebulize the child with three to five moles of 5% hypertonic saline. It's going to make the child cough. Um, and then after that, you want to use suction through the nose um, using a mucus trap um, and then transport that to your labs for investigations. In um, 2010, the WHO endorsed the use of GeneXpert to diagnose TB in children. Um, it's great for rapid detection of MDR, TB, and HIV-positive individuals. And we can use it on sputum specimens, um, but we can through any of our different methodologies, whether we do it through a gastric aspiration, bronchial washing, sputum inductions, etc. Try and get a sputum. I'll make very few quick comments on the GeneXpert. Um, there was a great study done at UCT in 2011 that showed there's got a very high specificity in children, the same as an adult. If you've got a positive gene expert, you can be sure that it's TB. Um, and that it's certainly much more effective than the old-fashioned AFBs, and has been shown to be more effective than X-ray in making a diagnosis in, of TB in children. Um, it is better in our HIV-infected than our HIV-uninfected children as a test. Um, but it has a lower sensitivity compared to adults. Again, they don't make as many bacilli as the adults, and so there's not um, the gene expert rates are, are there's a lower rate of detection. But so many, so many as two thirds of cases that was eventually culture positive, they were able to pick up early on a gene expert, um, and you have your information on rough resistance, um, which is great. So I want to go back to a little case that we discussed um, in the first presentation when we looked at the background of TB. And now we look at how we're going to approach this child. So this is a five-year-old boy suppressed on ARVs, and he's got a history of being repeatedly treated for a lower respiratory tract infection. Now he's represented with his cough. And the question we asked ourselves last time is, when we now think about this child, how do we start thinking about investigations? Do we give antibiotics again? Do we put them straight on TB treatment? So let's go through this case using our five questions. So question number one, what is the risk? Now, this child is five years old and this child is HIV positive. So that means if this child has been infected with HIV, there's a high risk that that TB infection will go to TB disease. 
So our question number two is, oh dear, has this child been exposed? And mom and dad has both died from an unknown cause, so we're not sure. Maybe there has been TV exposure. Maybe there hasn't. So in this scenario, TST could be very helpful. If the TST is positive, it will confirm that the child has definitely been exposed to TV um, and would make us much more suspicious of TV. If the TST comes back negative, it doesn't help us very much. The child does have HIV. It might be a false negative TST. So our third question is going to be about the symptoms in this patient. Um, and this patient has had a cough on and off for two years now. Very, very suggestive. Although there's been some improvement with antibiotics um, and is not associated with exercise, seems to be worse at night. Very poor history of fever and night sweats, but as we mentioned earlier, night sweats is not very helpful. Fever is often missed, especially at night. Um, and although this child hasn't had specific weight loss, we are concerned that there's poor weight gain when looking back in the notes. The mom does report that the child is sometimes tiny. So now we want to examine this child and look for signs of TB. And the first thing, of course, is to plot our weights, and we discover that the child's got a Z score of minus 2. He has not lost, but he's certainly not gained any weight. Slightly increased respiratory rate. There seems to be decreased sounds in the mid-upper lung, um, but there's no clubbing or parotid enlargement, and the child is relatively playful and interactive. In a scenario like this, it'll be very important to do an X-ray to start looking for hyalur lymphadenopathy um, as a possible evidence of TB. And in the X-ray, we could see there was moderate hyalur lymphadenopathy, but nothing else that was specifically standing out. So although at this stage we have symptoms that are very suspicious, we do have a X-ray, we're still going to see if we can try and find bacteriological confirmation. Um, and we can attempt to get a sample through sputum induction on a five-year-old, um, or we could try and do a gastric aspirate, which we want to send for gene expert, and certainly also for TB culture. But the gene expert comes back negative, not surprising, if it is hyalur TB. Um, and here I want to use the IMCI guidelines, um, which has got a very simplified way of making a decision about TB. So if a child's got a close TB contact or two or more features of TB, we would actually treat that child as TB and classify it as TB according to the IMCI. If the child's got a close TB contact but there's no features of TB, we would call that TB exposure. And those children will need INH cover if they're under five years old. Um, and then we may have children where we've got some features of TB but we don't have history of a close TB contact. Um, or we just don't quite have enough evidence yet and we call that possible TB. And possible TB, we need to continue to follow up either until we've made a clear other diagnosis or the symptoms have um, cleared up or we finally decide, no, this is TB. Very important is we must be willing to treat without bacteriological confirmation. So what are we going to do in this particular child? So Lorato is definitely at risk with his age and his HIV status. Um, we do have a history of TB exposure, possibly with the parents having died. Um, he does have some of the TB symptoms and signs. He's had treatment antibiotics already for upper respiratory tract infections in the past. There has been no specific improvement. He's not gaining weight. Um, and even though bacteriological confirmation is a challenge in this child, um, we will decide to start this child for TB treatment um, for uncomplicated TB. So I just want to mention here, there's the IMCI classification, and then there's the blue card classification, or our public health classification. So according to IMCI classification, we would classify this child um, as TB. Let's just look at another case of a younger child so this is a five-month-old girl who was admitted four weeks ago for a low respiratory tract infection, and she was tested for HIV at the same time. And she presents at a clinic today with her mother for her results. She's been treated three times in the past with antibiotics, again, for low respiratory tract infections, and the mom says she's better. There's been no TB contact, and she still has a little bit of a cough. But the thing that worries us when we look at her is that she's failing to thrive, and her weight is she's just not gaining weight, and she's still on the same... Um, Z score of minus two. She does have some generalized lymphadenopathy. There's a few scattered crepitations, and she's got some hepato and splenomegaly. So we do our, our HIV test has come back positive, and when we look at the X-ray, it looks a bit like bronchopneumonic changes. There's a bit of hyalur lymphadenopathy. The mantra is non-reactive, 
Um, and the gastric washings is negative for AFBs, let's say also negative for gene expert, and we're still waiting for the culture. And just look at those lab results there for our HIV. So a CD4 count there is 5%, very, very low. But a high viral load of 300,000, and a full blood count at this stage is still normal. So if we use our five questions um, of workup for TB, question one, what is the risk of this little girl? Well, she's HIV positive and she's less than two years. So she's an extremely high risk um, for if she did get TB infection, it's going to go straight to TB disease. So question number two is exposure. And she's mantle negative and she's little. She's only five months old. And because the CD4 is very low, that might very well be a false negative. But you certainly want to question the mom very, very closely. And remember, you're not only asking of people with TB, you're asking of people um, of, in the household that might have a cough and might not even have been diagnosed yet with TB. Um, but this is one of the, yeah, this is making us a little bit less suspicious of TB if we can't find a clear history of a contact. Question number three is about symptoms. She's got a bit of a cough. There's been some response to the antibiotics, but not complete. It's not very convincing. Um, but there was a few signs that make us concerned. Question number four, especially the failure to thrive. And we do have some x-ray changes that could be due just to lower respiratory tract infections, but could also very well um, be due to TB. And we've tried to get a bacteriological sample, but the gastric washings is negative, and we're still going to wait for that TB culture result. So does little Susie have TB? So what's for um, a TB diagnosis? She's at a high risk age and she's got HIV. She's had this history of recurrent lower respiratory tract infections with poor growth. There's high lymphadenopathy on the x ray and she's HIV positive. What's making us less suspicious of HIV, while the P uh, of TB? Well, the PPD is negative, but it might be a false negative with that low CD4 count. Um, the gastric washings are negative, but again, it's a part of it's porcy bacillary disease probably in the lymph nodes, she's not likely to produce a lot of bacilli. Probably the biggest one that's making us unsure is that we're not sure where she got the TB from because we've not established a clear TB contact. But on balance, looking at this child, it was decided to start her on TB treatment. So we will look in the next um, presentation specifically on the treatment of Lorato and Susie. Here's just a few last important things to remember when diagnosing TB. So remember that children do get TB and you need to look for help early. All children with HIV must be tested for TB and all children with TB must be tested for HIV. And I'll add in here, all the TB, all TB suspects must be tested for HIV. TB is curable, provided we can get them onto treatment early and that the treatment is taken well. And if an adult is diagnosed with TB, we have to go and look for not only all the under five-year-olds, but also all the children who might be HIV positive in that household. And they need to be both investigated and given prophylaxis um, if, if asymptomatic. And so very important, if you've got a child who's having TB, you need to find out where's the adult contact and any other children that might have been exposed. Thank you very much. Please see our last e-learning module on pediatric TB that will be focusing on treatment and prophylaxis of TB in children.